So today we're going to be in the years 60 to 65, and then Jeremy's going to take us through the Jewish revolt that happens at the end of this particular decade, starting next week. Um, but today we're going to talk about genuine leadership, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I changed this next one. Yes, I did, good. Um, so we talk a lot about servant leadership and what servant leadership looks like, um, and it seems to be like this goal that everybody wants to attain. And it sounds good in theory, but oftentimes that's not actually achieved. Like we say, oh, well, in this organization we have servant leadership as our goal, and it maybe, maybe doesn't happen. So um, the church is no different. We know that we should be servant leaders within the church. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes people fall off the wagon and and aren't um, following that sort of servant leadership attitude and model that we've seen in Christ. So we're going to look at two examples today of two different people, one who was extraordinarily faithful to be a servant leader and one who clearly wasn't, um, both happening within the same um, sort of incident. So uh, just a quick review, um, as we talked about with uh, Jeremy in the first couple of weeks, is this increasing tension that we see between the Jews, the Romans, the Christians. Remember, the Christians are still worshiping alongside the Jews during this time in the temple, but the tension is continuing to ratchet up, and it's actually going to come to a head today, um, as we'll see. And then last week we talked about sort of the theological crises that have already begun to come into the church with the Jerusalem Council that happened last week. The controversy being whether or not Gentiles should have to be circumcised and follow the law in order to be genuine Christians. Of course, they decided there were only a few things that they wanted them to ensure that they were doing in order to A, not be a stumbling block, but also conform to laws that go you know, even before the Jewish law. And then, of course, we talked about the false teachers. We talked about how Simon Magus, although he was rebuked, um, ended up in Rome continuing to preach false teaching and uh, heresy, and how the reality is it's, it's like smashing, it's like playing whack a mole. You know, you take care of one and another one pops up. So it's just, it's a reality of something we face uh, in the church with false teachers. Um, we've already done that. So it's time for another history slam. So again, I'm going to kind of blast through some history really quick to get us up to where we're at and kind of do a little bit of review here. Um, I do want to catch a couple of things that we did not get last time, and I don't know, I, I, I was super remiss in not covering some of this stuff. So I want to talk about the Synoptic Gospels very briefly. This is a huge topic. Yes. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Thank you for that transition. So um, this is a really huge topic that, honest to goodness, we don't actually have a lot of time to discuss. Um, it is a very complicated issue, and it's one that we will probably address once we get to studying Mark in the late fall um, in the intro of our class. We're probably going to do a double intro there just so you're aware of sort of what the synoptic problem is. Um, synoptic means to read together. In other words, these three Gospels are so similar, not just in the stories they cover, but in the very vocabulary and words and wording. It's almost as though they're borrowing from each other, and they are. The trick is figuring out which borrowed from where at what time, who came first, et cetera, et cetera. There are, well, not tons. There's probably five different theories over which came first. I mean, there's various combinations of this. And I know the math doesn't work out to about five different theories, but the trick is that there's different variants on different ideas. Um, However, Jeremy and I tend to go with what the early church fathers said in terms of who wrote first. Um, so that puts us in an order that is, and I, uh, this is something I sent to you recently, and I don't know if you had a chance to look at that again. Um, but according to what I understand from what Eusebius records from Clement of Rome, who is a little bit later uh, uh, than uh, Peter, he's two down the row from Peter in Rome, um, the order should be Matthew, Luke, then Mark. Okay. So Matthew writes what a Hebrew gospel is translated into Greek, and he's probably writing around 50 AD, and these are hugely like around, okay? We just don't know. This is probably, these are probably some of the hardest texts to nail down. Um, but it's said that he wrote in the Hebrew dialect, which may mean Aramaic, it may mean Hebrew. We don't know, because it was translated into Greek, and the Greek is the inspired version that ends up in our text, okay? Then Luke comes along, uh, specifically writing to Theophilus, remember, um, but he's getting his information primarily from Paul and his own research, okay, and from Matthew's Gospel, very clearly borrowing from there. Um, Around 55, 
ish. Um, and then finally, Mark, under the watchful eye of Peter, is writing his in Rome around 59, again, around, um, and using bits and pieces from both of these. Now, you'll notice Mark's is much shorter, okay? You ever heard of an abridged version? Okay, so Luke's is the longest. I know it doesn't look like it. Matthew's got 28 chapters, but Luke's chapters are longer. He's got 24 chapters. So Luke's is longer. Um, so Luke has added a lot of additional research and stuff that he's put in there on top of Matthew's material. And he doesn't use everything from Matthew either. Um, they're not carbon copies. So, yes? So why do multiple versions? Uh, or, or why even take from the previous people? Yeah, so each of them have different emphases. Okay, so Matthew's emphasis is going to generally focus more upon helping Jews understand the fulfillment of Christ out of their own scriptures. There are, I, I may be wrong on this, so check me, but I think there are more Old Testament citations out of Matthew than there are the others because there's a lot more reference back to Old Testament. Yeah? Just to clarify, was Matthew the same Matthew that's the tax collector? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And Luke's the same guy that joins Paul in Acts. Okay, and then Mark is the same guy that gets booted to the side by Paul when he and Barnabas don't want to, or Barnabas wants to take him, but Paul doesn't, which we're going to talk about that more today. Um, Luke's specifically writing Theophilus. Um, he's presenting more of a um, Jesus as a man kind of perspective. So you have so Jesus the King, Jesus the Man, Jesus the Suffering Servant, which is an important theme in Mark. Um, but they each have their own sort of emphases as they go through. Um, so that's, that's primarily why. And what's well, the reason why this issue is important is because it helps us to understand when you see differences in Mark from Matthew, it tells us Matthew explicitly changed it to make some sort of emphasis. Not change the facts by any means, but just the way it's worded or the way he organizes the stories around each other. Um, it, helps to under, it helps us to understand what sort of emphatic statement he's trying to make about Jesus in a particular setting. So... Again, this is a really huge discussion that we don't have time for. And this is not the only order. In fact, this isn't even the order I was trained in. I just don't buy the one that I was trained in. So, um, academically, most academics think Mark was written first. I just, I don't buy it. So, so that's that. Um, and one caveat from last time. I, I thought about this whenever we got done. We talked about Simon Magus and how he believed and was baptized and still fell away historically. Um, one of the perspectives we gave was that he, or at least the presumption I left you with, was that he made a false confession and then, and then fell away. Um, I should mention that theologically there's another side to this, just so you're aware of it in case you run across it, which is that he made a genuine confession of faith and was baptized and was truly a Christian and then fell away from the faith and apostatized. Okay? This would be sort of your Arminian position. Okay, so just be aware that that's out there um, because that is definitely there. And I didn't want to leave that there because some of you may have come from those traditions where that was the kind of presumed approach to that. So just be aware of that. Yes? Can you discuss briefly the phrase, uh, somebody you know, who's suffered a shipwreck of their faith, what is involved there? It just depends. I mean, it really, are you honest to goodness, are going to have to take that on an individual basis. I, I, I will tell you, I don't subscribe to the camp. If you're a Calvinist, a lot of times what you hear is, or I shouldn't even say Calvinist, if you subscribe to eternal security, in other words, you come to faith and you can't fall away from the faith. Um, I don't subscribe to the camp that says, well, they'll come back eventually. Not, not necessarily. I mean, where's your data for that? Where's your biblical data for that? It's not there. There's no guarantee of that. And it's a nice, hopeful thing to say to families whose children have fallen away, but the reality is it's not necessarily true. I can't. Now, that doesn't mean they're not still in the faith and they're not, they're not just struggling and in disobedience. I, I can't say that for sure. But the point is, you, you, this whole theory where, oh, they fall, oh they'll, they'll come back eventually. Right, where's your data? Where are you coming up with that from? So it, that, that's what's hard. Uh, it, it just depends. I mean, you could be a Simon Magus where you're shipwrecking your faith meant you were a heretic and you are clearly not a Christian. Um, I, I, it just it depends on a person-to-person -person basis. Yeah, so. Basically, you're just not, uh, you've heard the truth, but you're just rejected. You're not bearing fruit. Of 
yeah. My biggest fear with not bearing fruit is that the Apostle John very clearly states that the way we know you're in the faith is by virtue of the fruits you're producing. And that's, that's, that's part of assurance is seeing the fruit in keeping with that. And James says the same thing. Um, yeah, mo- mostly my, I mean, James is one thing. John is mo- more scary to me because John bases his, his concept of assurance on acts that are in keeping with repentance. Um, if you don't love the brethren, you're not in Christ. If you say you have no sin, you're not in Christ. It's just, he very clearly says it's here in the text. It's just kind of hard. Yeah, the, the, some of these things are, we, yeah, yeah, it's way bigger discussion than we have time for. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to hit on that, and we certainly can at some point, but uh, it's a little beyond the scope today. So when we left off, we were in about the year 60. Uh, Paul had appealed to Caesar and was transferred to Rome. He's under house arrest there. Uh, he remained there in that Roman house arrest for two years, okay, up through 62. Um, so this is kind of a depiction here of his Roman journey. So he leaves from Drew, uh, Caesarea, because remember he'd been in prison for two years because the Roman governor didn't want to deal with him. And then as soon as the new governor came in, Paul said, Caesar. And then the governor doesn't have a choice. He has to send him because he's a Roman citizen who's appealed to Caesar for his case. Yes? Did you say that uh, when he was down there in prison in Caesarea, yeah. uh, that that's when Luke wrote his gospel? I, sure. I don't know. There's Honestly, there's no telling. He probably did write it over time. I mean, it ends with him under house arrest. Yeah. Well, Acts ends with him under house arrest. The gospel doesn't. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that messed with me this week. I was like, well, no, because you've got to push it back further so there's enough time to write Acts so that by the end of 62, he's under house arrest. So you've got to push it back far enough where he's still got time to write Acts, which is equally long. <laughs> so this kind of gives you an idea of the journey he made um, to get to Rome. It was not uh, lacking in peril, to be sure. Again, we've talked about that in Acts, and I want to spend a whole ton, bunch of time there. While he's in Rome, he writes these books, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. Um, and then preaches to Caesar's household during this time, interestingly. Um, during this time, Luke composes the Acts of the Apostles as well. And Acts of the Apostles actually ends with Paul in house arrest. And then that's it. That's the last word we get on that in the narrative form. Now, we do learn more about Paul from his letters and what happened afterwards in just little details and smatterings throughout his letters, but as far as actual narrative, this is the last time we see Paul um, is in that house arrest in 60 and 62. Uh, Festus dies in Judea. I spoke. I misspoke last time. I, I think I said Felix died in Judea. It was Festus that died in Judea. Um, and so Caesar, Caesar sends this guy, Albinus, to replace Festus. Another, again, another Roman governor. Um, any questions? This is where we're going to start. Festus took over from Felix? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there a specific incident that was involved in their deaths? Or was I think it was just he died. Yeah, I, I, I didn't read anything that said it was, un, it was any foul play or anything like that. I think he just died natural causes while he was there. Was Josephus still alive at this time? I would assume so, yeah, because this is pretty close to him. Because, I mean, Josephus was a, I don't know what his actual rank was, but essentially he was a general in the armies of the Jews during the revolt. And so... Might have been in his 20s at that time. Yeah, I mean, he was he was definitely alive because seven years later he's fighting for the Jews in the rebellion. So sounds like Star Wars. Um, or 30s. Yeah, or 30, something like that. Of course, Josephus was wise enough to see which way the wind was blowing and realize, but Jeremy will get into that. So, all right, so. We're going to talk about the trusted leader getting martyred. And I, I know I put these Star Trek things up here, but they're really just for me being a nerd. And if you get them, great. If you don't, it's okay, too. Um, so anyway, so we're going to talk about the trusted leader that gets martyred uh, today. So when Festus dies, it takes time for a new governor to get out there because he died unexpectedly. So Caesar Nero is having to send another guy out. Well, it takes time to get out there. So meanwhile... Uh, this guy, Ananus, uh, seizes the opportunity. Now, it's also a good time because what happened is, interestingly, Eusebius notes that 
You know how the, there was an assassination plot against Paul in Acts? If you don't, there was. Um, what happens is when he takes off from Caesarea, suddenly their target's gone and out of range. So now they have to pick somebody else. So now they're going to target James the Just, Jesus' brother. Okay. So with that being said, this guy Ananus, uh, who has been appointed high priest by Agrippa, um, he seizes upon the opportunity. There's a power vacuum from the Roman governor. Paul's out. He wants to go after James. And so what happens is he convenes a Sanhedrin council. Now the problem with that is only the Roman governor can um, call that at this time. Now I don't know what the deal was during Jesus' time with that particular Sanhedrin council, but at least during this time, they're not supposed to be calling these councils without the permission of the Roman governor. But he calls one anyway to pull James into the temple and get him to actually confess against Christ in front of the whole crowd so that the whole issue can be put to rest. And of course, that's not how it goes. Uh, James the Just, again, brother of Jesus, um, was the head of the church in Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, this is not James the Apostle. Remember, he's already dead. He was beheaded by Herod uh, Agrippa uh, quite a while back already. Uh, James' reputation was as the just. He was, he was very well respected, not only by the Christians, but the Jews as well. In fact, we're going to read that here in just a little bit. Because um, I actually want to just read out of Eusebius, because I think you need to just hear the story. But he had a good reputation amongst both. Very well respected, um, despite the fact. But Eusebius writes very briefly in one section. He said, he was by all men believed to be most righteous because, uh, uh, he was of, because of the height of which he had reached in a life of philosophy and religion. Of course, there's more detail given later from other sources that he says, but he was very well respected. This is a very important element. Hence the reason he's being brought out to deal with this issue. Kind of being put up as a, as a scapegoat to be able to solve the problem or suffer the consequences. So they convene, they bring James in and and under pretense, and then they ask him to deny the faith. And of course... James doesn't. So what I want to do is I want to actually read this account for you. Um, Hegesippus was a chronicler in the church sometime in the middle of the second century. He lived from 110 to 180. Um, and he records a pretty good detailed story here. And I just want to read it because it's there's just a lot of detail that I'd, I'd love to be able to go over, but it just makes more sense to read it. Uh, I'm going to start with Eusebius uh, here in uh, his setup to Hegesippus. He says... When Paul appealed to Caesar and was sent over to Rome by Festus, the Jews were disappointed of the hope in which they had laid their plot against him and turned against James, the brother of the Lord, to whom the throne of the bishopric in Jerusalem had been allotted by the apostles. The crime which they committed was as follows. They brought him into the midst and demanded a denial of the faith in Christ before all the people. But when he, contrary to the expectation of all of them, with a loud voice and with more courage than they had expected, confessed before all the people that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they could no longer endure his testimony, since he was by all men believed to be most righteous because of the height which he had reached in a life of philosophy and religion and killed him using anarchy as an opportunity for power since the, at that moment Festus had died in Judea, leaving the district without governor or procurator. The manner of James's death has, sh- has been shown by the words of Clement already quoted, narrating that he was thrown from the battlement and beaten to death with a club. But Hegesippus, who belongs to the generation after the apostles, gives the most accurate account of him speaking as follows in his fifth book. And this is a quote from Hegesippus. The charge of the church passed to James, the brother of the Lord, together with the apostles. He was called the just by all men from the Lord's time to ours, since many are called James. By the way, I should mention, the name James in Hebrew is actually Jacob. Just keep that in mind. Um, But he was holy from his mother's womb. He drank no wine or strong drink, nor did he eat flesh, nor razor went upon his head. He did not anoint himself with oil, and he did not go to the baths. That doesn't mean he didn't bathe. He didn't go to the public baths, okay, which were a Roman thing. He alone was allowed to enter into the sanctuary, for he and the sanctuary being the temple, okay. At this point, he's the only one allowed in there. Um, this would be uh, not so much. I may be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure that means like the actual inside the building. So he's like the only Christian who's been allowed to go inside the building, not just the temple grounds outside. 
Um, I may be wrong on that, but I think that's what the intention is. For he, had, he did not wear wool, but linen, uh, and he used to enter alone into the temple and being found kneeling and praying for forgiveness for the people so that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of his constant worship of God, kneeling and asking for forgiveness for the people. I think he actually earned a nickname later on, Camel Knees, um, because of that. So from his excessive righteousness, he was called the just and oblios, that is in Greek, rampart of the people of righteousness, as the prophets declared concerning him. Thus some of the seven sects among the people who were described before me in the commentaries inquired of him, what was the gate of Jesus? This is their question. Okay, They want him to explain what Jesus is or who Jesus is. And he said that he was the Savior. Owing to this, some believe that Jesus was the Christ. The sect mentioned above did not believe either in the resurrection or in one who shall come to reward each according to his deeds. But as many as believed did so because of James. Now since many even of the rulers believed, there was a tumult of the Jews and the scribes and Pharisees saying that the whole people was in danger of looking for Jesus as the Christ. So they assembled and said to James, we beseech you to restrain the people since they are straying after Jesus as though he were the Messiah. We beseech you to persuade concerning Jesus all who come for the day of the Passover for all obey you. For we and the whole people testify to you that you are righteous and do not respect persons. So do, you, uh, so do you persuade the crowd not to err concerning Jesus for the whole people and we all obey you. Therefore, stand on the battlements of the temple, that you may be clearly visible on high, and that your words may be audible to all the people. For because of the Passover, all the tribes with the Gentiles also have come together. So he's at, they're asking him to go stand on top of the temple. I don't know if that was a setup, just in case, almost as sort of a subtle threat or not, but it's certainly not comfortable because it's pretty high up there. And I'm acrophobic, so that doesn't help. So the scribes and the Pharisees mentioned before made James stand on the battlement of the temple, and they cried out to him and said, O just one to whom we all owe obedience, since the people are straying after Jesus, who was crucified, tell us, what is the gate of Jesus? And he answered with a loud voice, Why do you ask me concerning the Son of Man? He is sitting in heaven on the right hand of the great power, and he will come on the clouds of heaven. And many were convinced and confessed at the testimony of James and said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Then again, the same scribes and Pharisees said to one another, We did wrong to provide Jesus with such testimony, but let us go up and throw him down, that they may be afraid and not believe him. And they cried out, saying, Oh, oh he even the just one erred. So, they're basically now accusing James instead. And they fulfilled the scripture written in Isaiah, Let us take the just man, for he is unprofitable to us. Yet they shall eat the fruit of their works. So they went up and threw down the just, and they said to one another, Let us stone James the just. And they began to stone him, since the fall had not killed him. But he turned and knelt, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord God and Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And while they were thus stoning him, one of the priests of the sons of Rechab, the son of Rechabim, to whom Jeremiah the prophet bore witness, cried out, saying, Stop! What are you doing? The just is praying for you. And a certain man among them, one of the laundrymen, took the club with which he used to beat out the clothes and hit the just on the head, and so he suffered martyrdom. And they buried him on the spot by the temple, and his gravestone still remains by the temple. He became a true witness both to, the Jew, to Jews and to Greeks that Jesus is the Christ, and at once Vespasian began to siege the city. Which is sort of correct, sort of not, because it's a little bit later before Vespasian actually does. But So that's James the just dying. Thrown off the rampart, doesn't die, gets stoned, prays for them, and still alive, and then gets clubbed in the head. Never stopping to testify to Christ, even in his suffering. Even though He's a powerful, I mean, theoretically, this guy's a powerful leader in Jerusalem. He's got credit. He's got honor in the eyes of the community. And still, that's what he took. Ananus got in big trouble. He got booted from the priesthood. Wah. Probably shouldn't have been in there in the first place because he was an appointee rather than actually, he might have been in the house of Levi, but he may not very well been legit. Then Agrippa II appoints, uh, by the way, Jesus is a fairly common name. Just heads up. So if you see Jesus a lot in church history, that's... that's Are you sure? So if they find a tomb that has the name Jesus, it's not referring to Jesus? Probably not. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, no. Very common name. Um, but he appoints a different guy, the son of uh, Domnaeus, as the high priest. Um, so they took him off, threw him off, and instead he continued to testify of Jesus. Uh, that's an artistic depiction of this event. I have no idea when it was made. I just thought it was really well done for its time. Um, survived the fall, beaten to death, and he was crying this. I beseech you, Lord God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Continue to testify to the faithfulness of Christ. That's a servant leader. James demonstrated genuine servant leadership as he demanded of himself the faithful testimony of Christ that he expected of the church. In his dying breath, he was testifying to Christ just as he would expect all his people to be doing. Because they were all, I mean, people who believed were standing there. I mean, imagine how horrible this is. Someone being murdered in the temple grounds by the people who are supposed to be mediating to salvation to God. And here's this guy testifying to this, demonstrating the exact sort of faithfulness. He's not expecting any more of them that he's not willing to give himself. So, pastors and teachers and givers, walk in the manner of your teaching. If you're expecting people to do the things that you're calling them to, then you better well expect that of yourself. Administrators, don't always relegate. Get into the midst of the work yourself. Show people that you're willing to do the work too. Those of you who are our faith, strong faith people, demonstrate the faith that people are supposed to have when faced with severe trials. Show them what that faith looks like. Our mercy helpers, come alongside hurting leaders who are trying to, to be faithful servant leaders. Show the mercy that people are supposed to have. Don't be a burden. We see that in Scripture, too. Don't, don't be a burden to your leaders. But, but show them mercy. Our prophet exhorters, be an example of persevering faithfulness to those you are exhorting. Show them what it looks like. And discerners, pray for discernment as, the, as to the intentions of those who persecute or the leaders who are supposed to be servant leaders. James didn't burst out with condemnation against his persecutors cried out for mercy for them it's just some thoughts there all right any questions with that good deal all right so the replacement betrayed so um, <clears throat> right after James dies now we have to find a replacement. Okay? So in the aftermath of his death, Simon, son of Cleopas, is appointed. He's the cousin of Jesus. Okay? Um, same Cleopas, we believe, who met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Okay? Not the same son of Cleopas. Make sense? Okay. Um, so Simon's appointed to take over in Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, presumably because there's still a familial connection with Jesus. There was some sentiment in the church that this, this was uh, something that they had not lost yet. They still had family members who were faithful that could take over. Um, and it's not a dynastic thing by any means. It's just something they thought was valuable because they had grown up with Jesus. So, um, However, there's this guy, Thebutes, or Thebuthis, or Thebuthis, uh, who began to seek the corruption of the church. The problem is, this guy got passed over for the job. Okay? Um, he wanted the job. He got passed over. And so, what he did was he started to preach corruption in the church and heresies because he wasn't happy with the fact that he had been passed over. Quite a contrast, yes? Get a guy who's willing to die for his people and then his... Attempted replacement is just a power-mongering, whiny baby. So, um, I'm not going to, I was going to read this whole thing, but this is a citation of kind of the, the background of what happened there with this. You can look this up. Um, if you want, I can send you a link to this, but it just kind of gives the basic story of, of uh, what happens. Very short. 
Um, we only have, and again, that's from Hegesippus. We only have, none of Hegesippus's works survive. We have eight citations within Eusebius, and that's it. Um, two of them I've shown you today. I read the one, and then that was the other one. Um, a real brief in that one. Um, but the problem was he became a false teacher because he wanted power. That was his response to not being given power. He wants to be a false teacher, to corrupt the church instead of actually serving the church in the capacity that God had clearly ordained. And really he's no different than the scores of high priests that have sought power from the Roman governors and the Herodian kings that have been appointed as high priests in the temple who really don't have any right to be there in the first place. Because if you remember from uh, the first five books of the Bible, a very specific line of people are supposed to be high priests. The sons of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. These are guys that are supposed to be the high priests. A lot of these guys who were during this time weren't. They were just appointed. And why were they appointed? Because they're puppets. Okay? And when they don't play nice, we toss that puppet out and we get a new Pinocchio. So, when the nose starts to grow, we toss it out. Oh, time for the stool thought. So, do you have to accept something less than you want? Um, if you'll indulge me with a little bit of a, a personal story, wasn't planning on talking about this, but it, I guess it's useful and instructive. Um, when I, growing up for me, it was always what's next, what's next, what's next, you know. So I got done with fifth grade, oh, on to middle school. Got done with eighth grade, oh, it's on to high school. Got done with high school, oh, it's on to college. It was just this natural progression. Oh, we get on to college. Clearly, we need to go to graduate school. It was only a year and a half before I went to seminary after that. And going to seminary, what's next? Well, I should be full-time ministry. <sighs> Not happening. And I've been st stuck at the job I've been stuck at for quite a while. Quite a while longer than I anticipated being stuck at this job. Um... Not what I had planned at all. And it's been a very humbling experience. Thebuthis, guy's name's so funny to say, Thebuthith, Thebuthith, um, <laughs> could have taken that as an opportunity to allow himself to be humbled, to allow himself to go where God had placed him for specific reasons. There may have been a very good reason for being placed in that position that he could have taken the opportunity to seize and then do great things for the Lord. But instead, we're going to whine about it because we didn't get what we wanted and then make problems. Sometimes your desires are not what God had in mind. And sometimes you're not going to get the high power, glorious job or station in life. And you need to see that as an opportunity to be obedient and humble before your God. I, I would love to be doing what we're doing right here full time, but it's just, that's not putting food on the table, folks. So, not that I'm discontent with my job, but I do know there were times I tried to get out of it. Multiple times. I think four or five times. And God said, no, not happening. Not a bite one trying to get out. So I accepted it, moved on. Things are much better now. So just a heads up, just something to think about. So uh, last week we had the, um, the false teacher flow chart. This week we're going to have the power flow chart. So there are three big things that people generally seek. I mean, this is an absolute. Again, these are some observations. Power, wealth, and pleasure. If you can't get power, then wealth. If you can't get wealth, then pleasure, because that's all that's left. Okay. So I'm going to kind of show you real quick this flow chart that I came up with, the power-hungry flow chart. I want power. Did I get it? No. So seek money to gain power. Okay, that's, that's an attempt that I can make. Uh, get it? Yes. So what do I do to stay in power? Keep making money. Keep attaining wealth to maintain my power. Uh, didn't work? Uh, uh, try slander. I'm going to slander people so that I can rise above them. I'll bring them down so eventually they'll be pegged down below me and I'll have power and control. Uh, did I get it that time? Yes. Uh, keep talking and stay in power. Politicians. 
Um, did I get it? No. Okay, now we're going to try violence. Did I get it? Yes. Keep your stick and stay in power. Have you guys seen uh, um, Home? It's a, a, a it's an animated movie about these aliens that come to Earth and move all the humans to Australia. Um, but the head guy's got the um, the thumper or something like that or the whacker, and th he's the one in control. He's the one who's in control because he's got the whacker. Okay. Um, same sort of thing. Keep your stick and stay in power. Uh, did it not work? Okay, uh, get a bigger stick. And then try again. Okay. Now, if it did work that time, get pleasure at all costs. This is where your drugs and your addictions and all those sorts of things come in. Because you've lost all ability to gain power in your life. And now this is all you're left with. Or you could just start way back here and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to seek power. I'm just going to submit and be humble. So this is the kind of thing you tend to see. Again, this is just an observation of mine. This isn't absolute. This is not some biblical framework I've described. It's just something that I've observed, um, the kind of the ways people generally operate. What's really scary is when we get here. Really scary. Um, when you get to a point where you feel like there's no alternative but to enact violence, that's not okay. So, so pastors, teachers, walk in a manner reflecting your teaching. Humble yourselves to your calling. If you're a pastor, teacher, and God's calling you to teach little children for the rest of your life, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is what God seeks to be glorifying from you. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. God stuck me there. I mean, shoot, I've been teaching five to ten year olds for 12 years. It's okay. It's fun. You probably wouldn't recognize me if you came to work with me. <laughs> um, administrators, do not be enticed by the power that can come with having access. A lot of administrators are behind the scenes. It's real easy to get power hungry. Be careful about that. Our faith people help others realize that just because they are not important doesn't mean they're not going to be rightly used by God. Okay? They've got to be able to trust. Our mercy helpers engage the hurting in the midst of these events. Help people understand. Show compassion toward these people who are struggling with this sort of thing. Our prophet exhorters exhort people to humble themselves. I always laugh at people who have life verses. Because I always wanted to have the life verse that says they built the wall as far as the par bar. I'm not even sure where it's at, but I, I want it to be my life verse. But this is more of my life verse if I had to have one. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Discerners, pray for discernment of right motives. Okay? To have right motives about things. Humble motives. And givers, support those who have humbled themselves to labor for God in their various settings. Guys, there are people who are truly humble, working in very humble and lowly circumstances, who need your support and resource if you're our givers. They just do. Some hard jobs out there. All right, questions with that? All right, so another history slam real quick, okay? So 62, John Mark becomes Bishop of Alexandria. Yes. The gospel writer John Mark, they send him to Alexandria to be the bishop. Yeah, that John Mark, the one that got booted to the side by Paul, said, Nope, he ain't coming on this trip, pal. He, he bailed on us last time. Barnabas says, No, 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 no. We need to take him. Did he, did he start the Coptic Christian church? Uh, that I don't know. I hope he can't claim that, but I don't know. Because I think they claim it. It's possible, yeah. I think both Paul and Barnabas were right. I don't think Paul's much of a nurturer. <laughs> and that's okay. I know people who are very faithful and great men that I respect highly, but they're the kind of guys that are going to kick you in the butt to make you a better person. Um, but I also know guys that are like this, like Barnabas, who are very nurturing because they need to be nurturing with certain people. John Mark needed a nurturer. Again, it would have been glorious to go with the apostle, but I had to go with the, the second-rate missionary, Barnabas. But that's what he needed, and lo and behold, 
He ends up being Bishop of Alexandria. And a gospel writer, <laughs> for crying out loud. Uh, Festus dies in Judea. We talked about that. Albinus takes over as governor. Um, 63, Paul's released from his house arrest. Um, and he begins another journey. This time he goes to Crete, Macedonia, Spain, and finally Rome. Uh, back again. So this is my reconstructed map. Sorry, Sicily looks funky. Um, I had to reconstruct this from another map. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of what he did. So he leaves from here, goes over to here, down to Crete, back up to Spain, and then back to Rome. So this is the fourth missionary journey. Okay. When he gets back to Rome this time, though, he gets thrown in the pokey, and this time it ain't going to go well. Okay. Why did they throw him in the pokey? I'm not sure. Preaching the gospel? I think that was the Nero's yeah, I mean, persecution. Rome burns. Um, Nero gets a bad rap with that. Um, I don't think it was quite as, as bad on his part, because I think, from what I understand, there are actually accounts that he actually went down and was helping throw water on the fires, um, but after that he uses that opportunity to blame the Christians and starts persecuting them, and then Peter and Paul are both executed. Um, at that time, uh, during this time in Macedonia, Peter write, or excuse me, Paul writes 1 Timothy and Titus, and then Peter about this time in Rome writes 1 Peter, and 2 Peter maybe a little bit later. Um, that's beyond our times for today. Florus becomes governor of Judea after Albinus. Um, problem with Florus is that Josephus cites this guy as the main instigator of the Jewish revolt. Not that tensions haven't risen considerably over the years, but Florus is really the guy who just throws a match on the gasoline. Um, the gasoline's been pouring out for quite a while, but he's the one that really throws the match on it and ignites it. So Festus died. What happened to Albinus? Did he die? Did he get replaced? He may have just been replaced. There's no telling. So, um, I'm, Josephus might say something. I'm not quite there yet in my readings. Um, again, I will readily admit I'm not the historian. He's sitting back there, um, so he'll he'll fill you in on all that stuff. So, um, so then uh, Paul writes. I already said that. Why, why are you up here again? So stay tuned. So, any questions with today? I just want to leave you with this last point here. Um, no. Um, Micah 6 8 is a tremendous verse, and I think it really encapsulates the point we're making today. It also encapsulates, I think, the law very well. Um, he's told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require. Uh, before this, Micah is talking about the fact that it's not about the sacrifices you offer in the temple, okay? And, he's, and, and the Lord has said this in other places as well. The point is to do justice, to love loving kindness, <clears throat> and to walk humbly with your God. It's all God's asking us. You know, justice is basically the process by which we bring peace and order, which again is one of my big shticks, you know that. Loving kindness. I love this phrase to love loving kindness. To actually have a loving desire to do loving acts. I love to love people and do for them without expectation of reciprocation, mind you. I'm not doing it so I get anything back. I don't expect anything back. It's loving without any expectation of return. This is your, in the Hebrew it's chesed, but this is your agape type love from the Greek that you're used to hearing about. And then of course walk humbly with your God. Okay. So that's kind of my summary for today. My life first. Second only to the built the wall as far as the power bar. Alright. So any questions for the day? We good? Okay, so we're gonna cover John Mark more next week. Uh no, John Mark's probably pretty out of the picture for right now. Yeah. Do you have a question about it? Oh, I just you brought him up that you know that just the nurturing verse, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I was just going to point out that the point that, you know, he writes his gospel. I mean, you have a guy who Paul thought was just a slacker. Barnabas nurtures, and then he ends up with Peter writing a gospel. And then Peter ends up, and the church ends up sending him to Alexandria to become the bishop there. And Paul calls him useful. And Paul calls him useful. I mean, Paul, I, again, I think, I think both Paul and Barnabas were right. Paul needed Silas to do what he needed to do, and Barnabas needed Mark. 
and Mark more so now I think needed Barnabas. But it helped tremendously. I mean, Mark became extraordinarily important to the church. Uh, but I just want to point that out because th- that's what's happening during that time as he is becoming the Bishop of Alexandria. And I think it's always important to show that just because you have a bad incident doesn't mean you're totally toast. He had a bad incident where he was he, he bailed. He totally bailed on him. And Barnabas said, All right, we're going to try this again. So, yeah. What does Barnabas mean? Son of encouragement. That's Aramaic. Yeah. Barnaba. So... Which was not his real name, by the way. That was a that was a nickname given to him, um, but that's what he was called. Sort of like James the Just. So, all right, we good? Cool. James, uh, Jeremy will lead us through the Jewish revolt all next week. He'll get all the way through it. <laughs> no pressure at all, um, and we'll keep moving. Uh, <laughs> cross fingers, we might get to a hundred before we get done this summer. So we'll see. <laughs> Well, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for our time. We thank you again for your faithful servant, James, um, that even in dying, he's confessing you as Lord and demonstrating to us what it means to take that confession on our lips all the way to our deaths. Father, we pray that you'd help us to be servant leaders in whatever capacity we are supposed to function in the body of Christ, to live up to the testimony of your name in all ways. Pray you bless us as we go out to, to make your name known in this week in our work, in our communities, and uh, as we travel to make it your name known in the world. We pray this all in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.